Okay, welcome everyone. So our next speaker is the co-author of the Groovy2 cookbook and is a freelancer in Java consultancy and also DevOps work. So for the next uh, 50 minutes, uh, we'll be listening to Andrei Adamovich on visualizing Java code bases. Very well, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, my, my name is Andre, and I'm going to talk today mostly about visualization and about visualize, mostly about visualization, visualization tools that can help visualize data, not necessarily data about Java code bases, but actually any data. And uh, yeah, this tool set was kind of uh, collected. Uh, I, I collected the notes about this, the tool set that I use uh, during the, my consulting work. And uh, my usual background <clears throat> is that I come to clients, to my clients, to consulting clients, and uh, help them with their Java projects, coding, automating something, and also analyzing the code bases. And that's where I usually need input. Uh, Okay, uh, first few words about me. Uh, I am primarily a developer, uh, and I always was and always will be a developer. Uh, also, because of you know this fashion of automating everything, uh, I actually jumped into DevOps and automation and software delivery, so some, somebody would call, call me a DevOps guy, even though I don't like it. I am a developer with developer mindset, I, and I apply it everywhere. Uh, also, I'm training uh, sometimes, uh, speaking, like now, and organizing some uh, events in my home country, which is Latvia and um, uh, Riga. Okay, uh, let's start. So I already made a few words about my background, is that I, I, I'm, I'm a consultant. I do consult and visit clients quite a lot. And I sometimes face quite big and messy code bases, and obviously everybody expects from a consultant to give some quick analysis and quick results. So I need to do something quickly. And uh, analyzing millions of lines of code is not definitely uh, something I would like to spend time on. Uh, you probably know these numbers, uh, but that's quite interesting to, to know that the whole Google uh, code base is roughly two billion lines of code, maybe even more at, at this point, I don't know, but these this numbers were from like two years maybe. Facebook is 61 million, and Code bases that I usually face is roughly from 20K to 2 million lines of code. And those are com completely different stuff from uh, enterprise monoliths to a set of uh, microservices running in production. Uh, quite different code bases, quite different uh, uh, stacks. And uh, it, yeah, usually you have to, to, to have some common approach to understand what is going on. But, but it always depends on the context. And I hate reading code. I really, really hate reading code, and especially if you can imagine that we have two, two million lines of code to read, nobody wants that. So I, I like this comic a lot. Uh, because if, if you start reading one by one, you would probably find some bad stuff in there and something that you completely doesn't make sense. Uh, so you need to, to actually, you, you need to have a starting point from where to start. And in order to do that, you have to gather some statistics, obviously. So. Uh, what I would like you to offer in this presentation is that uh, m not, not specific metrics, uh, not uh, any, any, any specific tooling that uh, solves all your problems. I would like to offer you an approach to how you, how you look at code. And yeah, we all know that code is data, especially if some of you guys are into functional programming, you know that code is data, data is code, you can, you can interchange that. But we have to look at the code as data in, in a different way because Code, we can extract a lot of statistics from code. We can extract a lot of history information from code. And uh, that's something that comes along with, with any code base. And that's something that is actually quite interesting to analyze and mine and uh, find some, some useful facts and knowledge. So, uh, and if you imagine uh, uh, that like a repository uh, of you know, 100k uh, lines of code uh, and 20 developers working on that for 10 years, uh, the amount of events that happen to that code base, how many, how many commits, how many d d deploys, how many uh, merges, and all, all, all this stuff, the amount of data that is surrounding uh, that code base is, 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 is enormous. It's huge. Uh, and, uh, but, but at the same time, that data set contains a lot of useful information that you can use to not only understand the, why this software works as, as it works, but also to understand 
uh, something about the team that built that software. And especially analyzing like uh, temporal data about, uh, about uh, uh, the software project, you can get some insights about wh what happened in, this, uh, on, 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 in, in, in the life of the project for, for, uh, in its lifespan. And it could be that you, you actually would see things happening and you would know before you actually speak to the people how they behave, how, how they uh, work with the code. And it could, could be quite, quite interesting to, to, to to look at. So, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, there could be two ways or many ways to look at the code. And uh, what usually we use as, as a first approach, we, we, we take the snapshot, the current master version of, of, of the code, and we get some statistics and metrics out of that, uh, which is useful. But uh, I think what is more useful and is even more interesting how that code base actually got to that state. So, how what was the temporary, what, what was the del deltas and how many of those deltas were on, 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 on in the lifetime of the project that, that make that project to look the way it looks at the moment. So, uh, and both of these views uh, are, are, are interesting, uh, but I think this one is quite fascinating. So, uh, to anticipate some questions uh, after, the, after the, uh, the talk, I would ask you right away, who of you guys know Sonicube and use Sonicube? Okay, keep your hands, keep your hands up. Uh, I, I repeat the question. Who actually uses Sonicube for real? I mean, you, you, you go in Sonicube, you fix all the errors, you, uh, uh, and, and if any a new error appears, then you fix it uh, right away. Okay, slightly, slightly less people than in the, in the, in the, in the first thing, in, in, in the first question, iteration. Uh, and, that's what I see as well in, 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 in many situations for, for many clients. They do have Sonicube, which does run, but they have 10,000 warnings in that. And then when some, one, someone adds 10,000 first warning, nobody cares because I mean, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, and uh, don't get me wrong, I, I, I actually love Sonicube because it has a lot of statistics uh, and it uh, does that in, in, in a quite uh, structured way, I would say. Uh, but it's not that easy to get data in, and uh, it's not that easy to manipulate the data with the, the, that Sonicube has, especially if you know how it, the project evolved, they changed the database format, they changed the APIs, and uh, they changed the libraries they used to, to generate the code, to generate the statistics. So it's, it's a great product, but with some challenges. Uh, and also, uh, what... what, what uh, stops me from, from using it effectively is that data that is inside Sonicube, it's, it's snapshot data. It's, it's really the data about uh, the code base, but it doesn't contain any information about who, when, and what, and why uh, did the changes. So it's missing the, the, the deltas, basically. And, and usually, people, when they set up Sonicube, they don't really care uh, about uh, the configuring the rules, selecting the rules that they want to use. Uh, and basically, that's why you see uh, 10,000 warnings in, 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 in the code base, and you don't have time to fix it, especially when you see that the technical depth reported by Sonicube is like 10 years. No, no, never, never. Uh, so Sonicube needs to be tuned, needs to be, uh, you have to select rules for that. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant tool that does a lot of things, but don't just install it, you have to use it. Uh, and also some of the statistics that it provides by default, they, it is quite boring to, to, to and what, what I think we need to do with, with statistics about the code, we need to have discussions around that. We need to, well, we need to make them great again. We need to make the statistics great, they look great, and uh, use those statistics to actually provoke some uh, understanding about how, how you get to the state of this, of this code base, and uh, do some refactorings, do some uh, discussions about that, because if you don't do that, then statistics that Sonicube provides, it's, it's impersonal, and it's absolutely useless. You have to go there. Okay, uh, let me show you initially what I do when, when, I, when, when I get a, a new unknown code base. So of course, the first thing I do is something that uh, I don't need Sonicube for, uh, I count the lines. There is an absolutely great uh, tool uh, uh, that I show you on the next slide. Uh, but uh, size of the code base does matter. 
Uh, and of course, uh, we, we don't gonna, we're not going to measure uh, the performance of, of the project or the performance of, of developers using lines of code. It's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not the idea. But the idea is to actually get some estimates. And, uh, if, uh, and the thing is that most of the pro projects already are polyglot. And we need somehow to, uh, a good way to calculate uh, cost, uh, lines of code statistics for uh, different languages. Uh, and uh, maybe compare the ratio between testing code, uh, blank lines, commenting. It could be interesting to see. Uh, and depending on the language, it could be interesting to see how, what is the ratio. And uh, do, uh, do people comment the code, for example? And actually, specifically about commenting, uh, maybe five, seven years ago, I would say that, yeah, you need to comment your code, you need to write Javadoc. At this point, I would say, well, usually writing commands is, it means that you actually, you, you don't have enough, you, you haven't spent enough time expressing your intent in the code, then you write commands. So commands actually is a bad thing to me at this point. I would say that if you have a lot of commands, that means that either it's a public API, which has documentation, which is fine, or it's very purely, uh, poorly uh, designed code, because it has a lot of things that are described in the commands, but not in the structure of the code. And the tool that I use initially, as, uh, on any code base that I get, uh, is Clock. It's quite quite old tool, actually, but also at the same time quite powerful. Uh, it's written in Perl uh, originally. Uh, I think it's still still a Perl script, uh, and you, you can get an executable for, uh, for Windows, and uh, you can also run Perl script on, on, on any Unix systems. And the thing is, uh, the project now is is evolving. Uh, it supports many many languages, like dozens of languages of different types, uh, and uh, you can export data. Per, per directory, per file, per, uh, per project. Uh, you, can, you can basically get data out, out, of this, uh, out of this tool and get estimates of how big is the code base. Uh, and if you need to, uh, to use this uh, tool to calculate another, uh, lines of code statistics for different language, you can actually extend the tool using the scripts. For example, Gradle scripts are not supported by default and, and, and by, by clock at this point, uh, but because it's a uh, uh, kind of groovy-like language, uh, C-like language, and in this case, we can configure it to actually uh, do the proper, uh, correct line, uh, uh, line calculation. Uh, so, uh, and as soon as I get some data, I definitely would, would like to plot uh, that, and, uh, well, yeah, you can use Excel for that, obviously, you, but it's, it's boring, no, who needs Excel? Uh, pie charts are boring. We need to try to inject that stuff into some sort of infographics because, well, first of all, it's trending. Uh, second, it's, it looks uh, much more... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good word. Uh, and that actually drags attention. If, if, if you send Excel sheet to your team and say, oh, this is our code statistics, well, I, I bet that most of them will not even open that. But if you send them a picture with, uh, which focuses their attention on something that is important, uh, then you have much bigger chance. Because yeah, we, you, like you have to fight for, for the attention of your users, you have to fight for attention of your developers as well. So try to be creative there. And uh, as, as the first thing uh, that you can try uh, is uh, D3GS. Do you guys know that library? Oh, some of you? Yeah, well, roughly 30%. Extremely. Uh, nice library, uh, and it has a lot of examples of uh, how to inject ready data into uh, JavaScript uh, code and uh, visualize that in, in HTML. So basically something that you can share on web server and send a link to your developers and they, they will be happy. Uh, it has a lot of examples, a lot of uh, things are built on top of D D3 and uh, several books written on top of that, uh, which is uh, it's very nice tool in your tool set to, to know and to try to use to visualize the output of some uh, basic tools like clock, but also not, not so basic, which I will uh, describe later. A uh, few charts that I use quite often for, from, from uh, D3 uh, is calendar view, bubble chart, and uh, edge bundling. And I will show you a quick, quick demo of them. Let me see if I have that. Yes. 
So this is a calendar view. You probably saw that it's something similar in, in, in GitHub or in some other things. But the, the thing is that uh, the code to inject the data here is based on some uh, calendar data, and we can uh, inject data from, from clock uh, based on different snapshots of our code base. We can also inject data from uh, some other sources, from Jira, from, uh, from Trello, or from, from anything, and do some, some uh, coloring there. Uh, but the thing is, the, the, the idea is very simple, because what, what, what it needs in the end, it's very simple code base, uh, very, very simple snippet, which just reads a set of uh, calendar data available as, 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 as a JSON file. So generating JSON from CSV is not, is not rocket science. All of you guys, are go, uh, I guess, are developers. So writing scripts like that and having some nice uh, fun uh, and, and fun with the, with, 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 with the data is, 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 is awesome. And, and you can drag attention to, to, to actual data the one you provide. Uh, Something that works very well with the size data, like something that comes from clock, uh, is the bubble diagram. And uh, actually, I have one. Yeah. This one is a diagram for uh, Hibernate Core, uh, which uh, does some, uh, is basically a, a sizing of uh, the different packages inside Hibernate. And also, it adds additional dimension here, which uh, uh, is uh, color. And color is, uh, unites the data with the, uh, how, how, how often this uh, file or this package has been changed in, in, in recently. Uh, and basically, this is a, one of the ways you can analyze hotspots. And the thing is that the, the data set that will fit into that is simple JSON, uh, which we extracted from tools like Clock and uh, so, so some additional injection with like uh, Git log and uh, some, some, some scripts. Uh, of course, it takes some time to write those scripts, but at the same time, as at least for me, as a, it's it's quite fun and interesting to write these kind of things, because well, when I see the result, I can share the result with with my team and say, and show them this is the problem here. We have the problem here. Let's have a discussion. Uh, that's uh, quite important. Uh, another good chart, actually, that uh, I use quite often, and that I will, I will show you as well uh, some some examples, uh, is uh, basically coupling chart. So uh, on, on on the circle we have. Uh, different files uh, from our code base, or it could be different packages from our code base, and uh, uh, the lines are basically uh, how, they remind how often these things change together. So we have temporal coupling here. We add additional dimension on top of, uh, of, the, of our code base. We see which files change together quite often, and uh, this could be one of the ways to analyze which uh, uh, classes or which uh, uh, packages should actually could, could be refactored to an uh, isolated library, or some of them probably there's some design issue in there, and we need to decouple them somehow to, to remove this dependency and to understand how it goes. But again, this chart alone will not give you any answers. This chart is, a, is an input for team discussions that you can have. Uh, and uh, spending a bit of time on generating that and playing with JavaScript, playing with the, with the JSON data, CSV data, uh, is quite nice. Because, yeah, the result is quite rewarding. Uh, there are many alternatives to D3GS as well, so it's not the only one. Uh, you can probably find just you know, JavaScript visualization libraries in Google, uh, and uh, you will see a lot of examples, some, some, some of the, the ones that I know uh, of. Uh, uh, but if, if you can find the, some, something in D3 and some, some example in D3, you can try to find in some other JavaScript library and generate uh, an HT, some HTML that you can share with, 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 with your team. Another thing that you can use to visualize data uh, is uh, Tableau, or Tableau. I'm not actually not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, well, the thing is it's a commercial tool, but uh, they have a public version uh, which is much better than Excel, but the only problem, you can't really save the data. You can't really save the, the visualizations. So it can be used just for quick, uh, uh, for quick visualizations and quick uh, playing, with the, uh, playing with the data. And but when you are happy with what you get out of your data, you can try to go and uh, do something with D3 uh, instead. Uh, and the, the, uh, it's qu quite, it's a multi-dimensional uh, charting tool, which allows to, which you can, you can also write scripts there and uh, you, you can write different uh, groupings and it's somewhat like Excel uh, in, in what it does, but uh, it's much better at graphics, much, much better at in, in, in infographics, you, you can generate quite good things. 
uh, like tree maps, like bubble charts, like uh, different bar charts, uh, if, if, even maps if you want. Uh, of course, it has some learning curve, but it's worth it. Yeah, I'll, I'm probably not going to make a demo of that. Uh, another thing that I, I, I often do as, as, a, uh, as a team effort, as a, as a way to provoke discussions about the code base, is uh, I actually generate uh, kind of infographics for, 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 for the team. And uh, I use simple tools. I, I use Inkscape. Inkscape is a freeware, uh, freeware uh, which you can use to, to uh, create SVG uh, templates. And creating your own is not that difficult. Well, I mean, I, I like this template. I'm, I'm not sure if you, if you guys like it as well. Uh, but it's, it looks OK. Maybe not the super fancy modern fashion, but it, it looks much better than the stupid Excel sheet. And uh, the thing is that SVG, is, it's XML. So combining XML with some input data, writing script for that, it's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, what we actually, what actually did for uh, for some uh, some sort of one of the projects is that uh, I generated this chart, this SVG template out of data uh, combined from different uh, data sources, and we sent it to to the team uh, every every week, and we used that chart, uh, this infographics, uh, later on for for for, for doing retrospectives, uh, and uh, the thing is that this chart was not really static, was not. It actually was changing the colors. So it was uh, selecting uh, six metrics out of 15 metrics. So we we're showing only the important ones, the ones that changed, and the ones that has uh, b bigger, bigger impact on, 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 uh, on, on their value, uh, which again brings attention, uh, allows, to, allows people to, to get focus from people and to, to get attention from them because they, they, not, they, they not get using to get the same picture all, all the time. They actually have some, something new all, uh, 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 with every, every, every new mail coming from this uh, automation. Uh, another interesting way to visualize code bases, especially when it comes to uh, sizing information, like the gun coming from, from Clock or from, from SonarCube, uh, there's an idea of this code city. Uh, it was first uh, developed and designed by, 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 by Richard Vettel, uh, and he also created a tool uh, for, for doing that. You can also download that tool. It's not super user-friendly, but it's usable. Uh, the thing is also that Sonicube has a plugin, a uh, commercial plugin, unfortunately, uh, that can generate uh, uh, CD. Uh, city diagrams, uh, 3D city diagrams from uh, uh, from your from information about your code, uh, and also there is a library JC, uh, J, uh, JS city, uh, which does the same thing but for JavaScript code bases, but it can be adapted to generate and, and also the, uh, city information from, uh, uh, for any kind of code bases. Let me quickly show you how it looks. I have it here. So I think this is, this is a visualization of uh, uh, Angular code base, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, you can actually go and see what is this big building. And it's some plug-in resolver factory, which... Uh, and the thing is that with, with, with the CD diagram, you can actually place several dimensions on, 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 on that diagram, on that picture. Uh, the size and the color uh, means something. In this particular case, I think the size is uh, uh, the size of the building is the size of the file, and the color of the of the uh, of the building is, is the coupling with 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 other uh, 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 with other with other classes. So basically, uh, if it's if it's red, then it's more coupled with other with other classes, and if it's green, it's more independent, and if it's big, then it's just big 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 size. And and you can combine different dimensions in this case. And actually, in, the, in, 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 in that way, uh, the SonarQ plugin for, for, uh, for, for, uh, for the city diagram is quite, quite powerful because you can actually select different metrics uh, and uh, try to uh, play with the cyclomatic complexity, uh, code size code, and uh, some other things. Uh, but because this is just a JS, JavaScript library, Plus, it has some some uh, d d data backend. It's actually quite involving to use the JCD, the JSCD, uh, but it's worth it. It's it's worth it eventually because it's quite nice to bring this up uh, in, 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 in in team discussions. Uh, okay, yeah. 
I was talking more like static analysis before, uh, but let's look at what, what, what we can do with the temporal analysis. And of course, you guys all know GitHub, we have some sort of uh, uh, timing chart for what happened for our activity inside the repository. That's how it looked. I guess uh, you, you saw that already at some point. Uh, yeah, there's some, some good GitHub charts. Uh, the thing is that you probably can't, can't use GitHub visualizations for your uh, business projects, commercial projects. You have to do something else. Uh, there is a tool called Fisheye, which again is commercial and uh, which is okay, actually, it's, it's quite good, but if you don't have fish eye, you probably want to use something else as well. Uh, and the most amazing thing that uh, I like a lot, and that's something that I do, on, like the second thing I do after clock, I, I, use, I use GORS. A GORS is, is an amazing visualization that visualizes the history of your uh, uh, repository, of, of your software project. Uh, and yeah, in, in, a, in, in a second, I'll show you a demo. This is how you call it. You, you basically provide it with the, you usually run it within the Git directory or SVN directory, uh, and it reads the history of, uh, of the project and visualizes that. Uh, commits, authors, uh, files. Uh, and let me show you quickly how it looks like. Uh, it should be somewhere here, yes. So this is, uh, I generated video out of Gorse, and Let's see. So you see the date there, it's like 2007. It started all, all, all at that time. And uh, the, you see that, well, probably was some big refactoring. We deleted the branch. Uh, also, you see that the, the, the small uh, people, they're actually actual humans that are committing code to different uh, parts of the, of the directory tree. We see the refactorings happening. We see a number of files changing. We see that it's uh, like, yeah, it was uh, 3,000 files, uh, Java files at some point. Boom. I guess it was like, oh, we don't want Hibernate anymore. Uh, it's a huge refactoring again, and uh, it's quite fascinating to see how project evolved and uh, what happened with that. Uh, and one thing is that's funny about this uh, uh, videos is that when I show it to, to people, they usually go, wow, cool, but what can we use it for? And I would say, well, nothing, just for fun. Uh, and the thing is, it's, it's like a movie, uh, in, in, in normal, Normal movie, you would probably you, you would not understand every, every possible aspect of the movie that the director put into that by watching it only once. If you watch it a bit more time, and if you actually watch for some specific stuff you want to search in that, uh, you would probably find some, some something to uh, as a starting point, as, as as a hot spot that you want to to understand why it's happened like that. Uh, but at least this this is like a nice way to start conversations again, and it probably a nice way also to see. Uh, to notice who is the, like, the biggest committer, uh, at which points, at which dates we had big refactorings, uh, why, why, why that happened maybe. Well, you see this project was refactored like 10 times already and it's uh, quite interesting to see what, what was going on. And uh, also it's cool uh, that uh, on YouTube, if you, if you just go and type Gorse, uh, you will find uh, this kind of visualizations for a lot of different projects. Uh, for example, the, the, the most fascinating one is uh, uh, Linux kernel development, which started in 1994, I think. And you see that like, in, in the very beginning, the lonely Linus is uh, going around the code base and doing something. And then uh, after, after a couple of years, more people joining him and starting creating the kernel, and there's a huge refactoring happening. So uh, it's Quite fascinating and quite, quite, quite cool. So this is Hibernate. This is not, and it's like, it's very up to date. I generated yesterday. Uh, so like in, 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 in a minute, we actually will reach 2017. Uh, we'll see how, how, how big is the code base at that, at that point. But yeah. Do you like it? <laughs> okay. Uh, and Gorse is nice uh, for, for, for starting up, for getting some you know, idea what, 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 of what happened with, with the code base over the years. And you can select different speed if you want. I, 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 choose the, I cho have chosen the, the, the fastest one because, you know, uh, but you can actually have it even, even real time. Uh, what I did on uh, some of the previous projects, we actually generated the Gorse video for uh, a weekly uh, iteration. 
uh, and we just came just for fun. It was you know just for fun, and uh, we compared each iteration, uh, how how it looked like, what what happened with that, and then again, it's 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 a, it's a matter of for starting discussions, uh, and just make it fun, make it great again. So uh, another tool, the command line tool that, that I use often, and which uh, actually I like a lot as well, for analyzing the, the history of the repository is called CodeMat. And it's, it, w it was written by a guy called uh, Adam Thornhill, who is, I believe is from Sweden. So if you, if you, if you guys uh, uh, have a chance to meet him, to, to, to talk to him, he's, 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 he's a really great guy. So uh, uh, the input for Matt uh, is, uh, basically a git log or SVN log. Well, actually, it doesn't matter what kind of log it is. You can actually fit any, any other log if you want, but uh, originally it, it works for, for, with git. Uh, and uh, what you can, uh, and you, you can fit this, this git log in, 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 into, into mod tool, and you, get, and, you, and you get out of that some sort of analysis, uh, different types of analysis. Uh, I, I, I will quickly show you how, how it looks like. So. I have this, uh, let me check. Uh, where is my window? What? Hmm, interesting. Windows, Windows. No, ah, here it is. So, I have generated a, a git log from, uh, uh, from Elasticsearch repository, and uh, I can just show you that it's, it's there, Elastic, MIT, and, MIT, and MAT ex expects a, a very specific git log, but it's not, it's not that hard to generate. So it basically has an information about uh, all, every commit inside the repository. And uh, what I can do with, the, with that, I can specify the log, so it's gonna be Elasticsearch log, mod. And it has an analysis which, which uh, for example, is called coupling. And I will do head, so we don't display all the data. Uh, Mr. Ah, yeah, it should be minus, minus C git. So the, the, the thing it does, it takes the log and tries to find uh, how often different files change together. And for example, here, uh, and uh, the first column, you probably had, uh, this, is the, this is one line, it generates a CSV file. Uh, and uh, it has four, four columns in this case. So the first line is the, 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 the class, and the, the second one is the class that is coupled with that class, or that changed with that class. And the, 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 sec the, the, the third column is actually the confidence, the probability with, uh, at which these two classes change together. Uh, so basically, the integer field mapper and short field mapper, they always are committed together. So that's something that, uh, that's some, some of the information that you, you can use to uh, find potential coupling issues inside your code. In this case, it's probably okay because we, we, we know that it's just you know, updating of the, of the different handling of different types, uh, number types, so it's, it's fine. But it's quite fascinating to find these kind of spots inside the business code when you see that one constant file is changing here and it's always changing in, 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 in the other place. So something is uh, uh, coupled too much and something should, should probably either be decoupled or somehow optimized. Uh, and of course, uh, this tool will not give you the answers. It just will give you the data. And it's, it's up to you to find the actual facts and to understand why, why something is, is coupled too much. Uh, and uh, this, is, this kind of information will not be available with, with any static code analysis tool because it doesn't know the history. It only has the snapshot. Um, maybe it has the, you know, the dependencies between the classes somehow, but it doesn't have the history, historical information. And this is, can be quite fascinating to, to, to find out that, okay, these two things change together all the time. Why? Let's look at that. Let's see what, what, what is going on. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's too much coupling, like temporal coupling. Uh, maybe some logical coupling that, that, is not vis that is not usually detected by tools like Sonicube. Okay. And, uh, of course, when, when I have the CSV file, I can fit it into into 
Oh, sorry. In, no. <laughs> I can actually fit it into, into, into D3GS example, and I will get a diagram like that, which is, of course, uh, much nicer to analyze. And I can see that uh, in, the, in this particular case, the, the green one means that they are uh, less coupled, and the uh, red ones means that they are always changing together. So when we can play with the color. We can add dimensions to this, uh, uh, to this di diagram and uh, give much better input for analysis uh, of uh, analyzing why things are changing together. Maybe it's a risk there. Maybe it's some refactoring that is required. Uh, and this is much more valuable than analyzing, you know, the uh, static analysis tool warnings from, from check style, for example. Which you don't have, you know, the bracket on, 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 on the right line. This is, yeah, that's important, but it's not that important. This is much more important because it's related to the history of the code, related to the team that does that changes, related to the actual design and architecture of this, of this project, which is much more important than formatting issues uh, or, yeah, cyclomatic complexity issues. Okay. And uh, Matt has uh, different types of analysis and for, for uh, comparing the changes and, and uh, how many changes done. What is the age of the file, for example? Who is the author, the original author of the file? Or who is the, uh, the actual maintainer of the file? Because you only can extract the information uh, by knowing the history of, 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 of the file throughout, throughout, the, the, throughout its lifetime. And it's only stored in, 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 in Git version control or uh, SVN. Uh, it's, it's only there. So we need to combine the data with, from, from the history with the static analysis tools together to get actual uh, valuable knowledge about the code base. OK, I did the demo. Uh, another thing that, uh, yeah, I don't have that much time, but I hope I will show you. Uh, uh, so. Well, git log is basically, yeah, it's just a set of lines with the predefined format. And uh, we can index that into, into some data storage, which is fast. Uh, and uh, uh, one of them is Elasticsearch, for example. Uh, so Elasticsearch is a very simple interface with the REST API. And you can just get the Git information and put it into Elasticsearch. Uh, another good thing about Elasticsearch, obviously, is that uh, it's not Elasticsearch itself, but it also uh, is Kibana. Uh, how many of you guys know Kibana? Yeah, most of you. It's extremely good visualization tool. And if you feed the right data into that, uh, you can actually create dashboards on top of your Git log. Uh, and that's what I actually did. Uh, so I, I wrote a small script that actually converts the Git log into uh, indexing requests. Uh, and uh, we get, let's see, yeah, it works. So I have this particular chart here. I have the small screen. So basically, OK, what are you doing? Mm, yeah, that's not what I wanted to show. <laughs> So basically, it's, it's, it, by, by indexing that into Elasticsearch, you can do a lot of things that uh, Matt is doing on top of the Git log. Uh, but now you, you can actually save it in a dashboard. If, and if you do incremental updates of the, of the Git log and you index that into Elasticsearch, you, you can uh, interactively uh, have discussions with your team and having dashboards on, on top of that. So uh, yeah, this, this heat map, uh, actually, this is, this is a heat map, uh, which uh, is supposed to show interesting facts, but it doesn't anymore. Uh, okay, let me. Okay. So basically one dimension is, is the author of, 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 the, of, of, of the commit, and the other dimension is actual file. Let me, terms. And in this way we can detect uh, dependencies between uh, Yeah, that's what I wanted. Uh, so you see that in most of the cases, uh, the author and uh, the file he changes are independent, so there's no crossing. But in some of the cases, we see that there are many authors uh, that are changing the file. So uh, again, I'm not saying that it's always like that, but sometimes you, you can actually see that these people are either working together 
or that file has too many couplings. Uh, it, 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 is so many, it has too many dependencies that it, it requires people to change that file. And maybe that should, should be, it should be decoupled. So uh, I would say that you can use this information to either detect uh, problems with uh, dependencies and coupling, or you can actually uh, try to understand how your team usually works together. Because if they, if they work on the same content, I guess they actually have conversations. If, if they don't, then it's, 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 it's a bad thing, I guess. But uh, I, I would suspect in, 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 in a big project team, if people are changing the same file uh, over, over the course of uh, well, here is six months, they probably know each other, at least to some extent. Uh, but also, it will show that if, if, if you have fully green or fu fully filled uh, 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 chart in, in here, that would also mean something bad with, within the team, because it will mean that everybody is working on everything. So it could be, again, a problem with the dependencies and coupling, and a problem with wrong uh, isolation of, of, com of components and dependency injection. But it also could be that people are just like full stack developers, they change everything, and they're just ninjas, well, which is, again, a good thing. Uh, we don't know. But uh, we can use this as an input to, uh, uh, to, 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 to go on with some analysis. Uh, <coughs> sorry. And, and, and the thing is that with the, by indexing that stuff in, in Elasticsearch, you can actually get similar graphs you get uh, from GitHub. Uh, but now it's your code base, it's your commercial code base, and you, you can do whatever you want. You can do explorations. And uh, Kibana and Elasticsearch, they're quite fast, uh, which makes it quite, quite easy to, to, to use it as, a, as an input for, uh, for, uh, for your analysis. OK, uh, another thing. Uh, have you guys heard about this tool? Uh, only like, yeah, five, five, six, seven people. Uh, well, it's a commercial tool, unfortunately. But at the same time, it's extremely, it's, 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 an, it's an extremely good, good tool. And I, I actually, I own myself a copy of that tool. And I usually, it's my third or fourth step of uh, analyzing the code base. Because what it actually does, it shows tangles within, uh, within Java packages. It's, it's Java and .NET oriented, so it's not really applicable to, to, to many other things. Uh, but uh, in this particular case, we see that uh, there are three packages inside uh, a jar or a project which have interdependencies, which are not really decoupled. And uh, believe me, uh, I've seen much, much worse, uh, uh, much, much worse uh, uh, tangles. So tangle of free actually is, is okay. It's not that bad. But I have seen Tangle of uh, 200, which uh, is a huge mass code base, which is hard to refactor. But at least this tool can help starting from, from something. So you, you can see where, where the coupling is and try to decouple it. And it will give you the hotspots. It will give you the, the information. And uh, I can actually give you a quick demo of that. To, to measure the time we have. Eight minutes. So uh, I have it here. So this is Elasticsearch code base, uh, which is probably good. I don't know. Uh, and, uh, but the thing is that th this is the, 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 the whole engine. It contains a lot of uh, very engine-specific information and very, very engine-specific logic, uh, which I, I suspect some big uh, enterprise application would look very similar. Uh, and for example, we, we can see that, uh, we, we can take the package, and we see that there is some coupling here. Some, some, uh, so filter client depends on support package, and support package uh, classes inside support package also depend on filter client, which maybe is not a bad thing, but uh, I would say that it would be hard to decouple them. You, would, you see that they are coupled together. It's not, you, you can't really move away the filter client and the support uh, package because they, they, they call each other. Uh, and, and, and you can go through these packages and see uh, where, where, where are uh, different types of tangles. And, and maybe, maybe you, can, you, can, you can take uh, some additional actions to actually try to decouple them and try to, yeah, that's a funny. <laughs> OK, that, that, that is fine. But this is qu qu quite a fascinating tool because it finds, uh, uh, because it, well, initially it expects that your packages, the Java packages, actually are layered in a way uh, as your application should be layered. And if, if it's not, it will show you this information. It will show you that some things are the circular dependencies between 
components between uh, uh, sub packages, and uh, this information can be used quite quite well for for decoupling and de decom decomposing your monoliths into, into 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 microservices or into just just into better components. This is just just the extremely important tool in this, in, in this way. Okay, uh, so five minutes. Yes, one last thing that I want to show you. Uh, it's called jQA Assistant. It's a tool developed by uh, Dirk uh, Muller uh, from uh, Germany. Uh, and basically, the idea behind this tool is that everything is a graph, including the Java bytecode, including the, uh, everything that is inside the, the, the jar, basically. And there are many, depend many relationships between different components of uh, of, uh, of a class file, of a uh, jar itself. So, and what this tool does, it takes that information and puts it into a graph database, uh, which I guess you probably already guessed, it's, it's Neo4j. It's Java, Java, Java graph database, which is quite cool, especially because it has a quite nice uh, web interface. Uh, so, yeah, you just get the tool, JQA Assistant, and you can put it, you can put some stuff like your, uh, the, the binaries of your uh, projects in, into, uh, into a graph database, and you can then write queries to analyze different uh, nested dependencies, uh, find information, query information, and jQuery Assistant is called jQuery Assistant because it's actually uh, a, a build tool that runs additional rules on top of, uh, uh, of the graph data it extracted from, 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 from jars and uh, validates uh, that, for example, your, some of your packages are not calling the other packages. Uh, or uh, that, that uh, you, you're not, call, you're not uh, throwing uh, some uh, runtime exceptions in, in, in uh, places where you're not supposed to do that. So, uh, and the graph database allows that because uh, jQuery Assistant actually indexes that, uh, the whole relationship between classes, methods, exceptions, uh, jars, and, uh, uh, and you can write queries which look, look like SQL, but it's, it's, it's not SQL, it's Cypher, uh, which is the language that Neo4j uses. But it's very much like SQL, but very, very similar. So in this particular case, what, what we're trying to, to find, we're trying to uh, find all classes, and we can just count the, uh, the methods. So we find classes which has a method, at least some. So there's a relationship between node class and node method, and there's a relationship called declares. And what we return back, we return the, the fully qualified name of the class and number of methods in that class. Uh, so co could be yeah, a good way to detect uh, gut classes or big, uh, big classes. Uh, and uh, it's, not, well, it's, not, it's not as simple as that because you, you can actually write quite complex queries and you can write something that is not really possible to write in SQL, especially if you want to traverse a huge uh, uh, graph of resources, which will be relatively fast in Neo4j, but will not be that fast in, in, in any SQL database. Uh, and also, Neo4j has a console, which can be run in, 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 in the browser, which will allow you to visualize some of those dependencies. Uh, I, I guess I don't have enough time to show you that, but well, you have to trust me. Uh, Okay, so I'm concluding. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to share this information from Adam Thornhill. Uh, he, he gathered this, because he, he, he's the one who is uh, analyzing a lot of code bases, also running a company that uh, does code, code analysis uh, tools. And basically, it uh, doesn't matter what kind of code base you have, either it's Erlang or Ruby or Java or, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of files that you actually cha actively change would be roughly the same. So, uh, and all, all the rest will be not, not as important. So uh, in, in that sense, it's important to find your hotspots. It's important to find which things change often and which change, uh, things change together. Because by, uh, by using this hotspot information, and, by using, and the only way you can detect it is by using temporal information from, from, from version control, uh, it may allow you to, define, to uh, identify maintenance problems, to identify potential risks, to identify potential code review candidates, uh, and maybe even do some additional exploratory testing on top of uh, hotspot information, because that's most likely where you will need to do it. You don't need to optimize uh, to solve the problems that do not exist. You have to optimize for something that is more important. Okay, so extract data from your code, visualize it, uh, find hotspots, search for facts, uh, get some knowledge out of that, and become a data scientist or 
I would actually call it data journalist because yeah, that's what uh, it could be. And next time when, when you push your code, remember. Okay. Yeah, there's a book from, from Adam Pilkinger, which is quite good as well about the topic. Some books about the metrics uh, that you can, you can read. Uh, also, all the links uh, and all the, tool, all the tools are uh, available in the slides, and I will share the slides in, 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 in a moment uh, on, on Twitter. So just follow the JFocus tag, you, you will get it in the slides. And that's all. Thank you very much.